Hey, it's Tim, Pickup Truck Plus SV Talk, and let's talk oil, because I know you guys ask that a lot in the comments. Yes, I really comment on these videos about oil and how long it's lasting and clearances and bearings and all that kind of stuff. So we're going to get into that in this video. Today, I have with me Jason Head. He's a Senior Engineering Manager at Babylon Global Operations. Dun, dun, dun. Mm -hmm. That's a heck of a title. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so welcome to the show, Jason. Thanks, Tim. All right, so let's, let's, let's dig into this, because um, there's been... A lot of changes happened in the last couple of years. So we were talking a little off camera. We basically kind of lived in the same area in Michigan for a little while. And when we were growing, when I was growing up, it was 3,000 miles. That was it. 3,000 miles. You don't change your oil, man, you could knock a thousand bucks off the resale value because you did a damage to the engine. Right. And now we have these new oils that are so thin, you can like put it on your finger and not even see it. And you go like in crazy amounts of mileage, like 10,000 miles. Yep. And people are freaking out. I had a guy on a Facebook group who said he changed oil at 10,000 miles, sent it in the Blackstone Labs, and they said there's no problem with it. And I said, I'm going to grab pop, uh, popcorn, sit back and relax and watch all the YouTube go crazy. And then they go, oh, God, right. whatever. So, so for those guys that are like, well, have a little more gray in their beard than me, what has changed in this time period from 3,000 to 10,000 miles? And why, why would I go 10,000 miles? Yeah, so there's a lot of changes that have happened with oil technology from you know back in the 70s and 80s until now when you know we started driving cars. So and a lot of it's geared towards um, industry standards. So there's an industry uh, API, American Petroleum Institute. They set standards for engine oils. Um, and there's a series of tests. So um, there's a group of folks who get together um, for the API um, it's composed of oil marketers, engine manufacturers, uh, different folks. They come together with <clears throat> what their specifications, what their issues, maybe what their um, potential problems are with their engines that they want oil to address. So when you look on the back of a bottle of oil, you'll see what API spec uh, that oil is built for. So over the years, as we now have better base oils out there before everybody just used mineral oil. Uh, then we went to some folks had semi-synthetics. <clears throat> now, uh, you know, synthetics are all the rage um, and everything. So as we've had improvements in base oil, that, that base oil um, combined with whatever additive package you put in to to have your certified oil is what controls the oxidation and the wear and the different things in there. So, um, so with better base oils that are more resistant towards oxidation, uh, that combined with additives that go into the oils that prevent wear, prevent oxidation, all those things, we're able now to go a lot longer on oil than we were before, before it breaks down, oxidizes, and, and becomes har harmful to your engine. Yeah, so. I was reading through uh, your website this morning and different details on this because it's <laughs> it's quite interesting. Um, th there's a lot of conversation, though, about the the weight of the oil, which, by the way, the W mm -hmm. on your frequent, frequent ask question says W is for mm -hmm. winter, not weight. Mm -hmm. well, yep. <laughs> learned something new right there. I was like, oh, I've been saying that wrong for a long period of time. But uh, so we have weights yep. of oil, right? So mm -hmm. different weight. So are we able to go with thinner weight oil but still have enough uh viscosity and things to make sure the engine doesn't have excessive wear? Yeah. So what you get into is as we've gone to thinner and thinner oils, which is primarily driven by um, uh, corporate fuel economy standards is really where a lot of the, the thinner oils come from. So as the OEMs are chasing, you know, fractions of a mile per gallon for their fleet overall to achieve cafe numbers that the government requires. Um, they're doing everything they can to improve those numbers, you know, lightening vehicles, going to specialty tires. Uh, so inside the engine, any friction um, or, or lower viscosity that you can put in the engine to reduce any parasitic drag as the engine rotates helps with that miles per gallon. So in conjunction with that, as we've gone thinner with oils, <clears throat> you'll see tighter bearing clearances from the manufacturers. <clears throat> and you'll also see, uh, you know, newer technology now we see with uh, coatings inside the engine. So there's diamond coatings. There's all types of different surface finishes and coatings um, that they focus on when they design engines. And then we focus on as we design oils to go with those engines to uh, you know, basically have the least amount of resistance and drag in the system to achieve those fuel economy targets. What, what, what would you say to the guy that says, well, I don't believe that. I'm just going to go with a heavyweight oil because that has more protection because I can see the oil better in my fingers. <laughs> Right. And it, going with a heavier oil doesn't necessarily hurt anything outside of potentially fuel economy. And you don't want to go too far outside of a viscosity range. A lot of the engines now, um, besides the engine oil, 
being used as a lubricant. It's also used as a hydraulic fluid in the engine to activate uh, variable valve timing or uh, uh, cylinder disablement, you know, displacement on demand, AFM, all the different terms, all the manufacturers use for things there. So, um, so if you go too far out of viscosity grade, sometimes you can start to affect the way that those uh, uh, systems can react in there. So, okay. And, and uh, looking at heavier weights, there's always, there was a conversation I remember back in the, in the, when I was growing up, you used a heavier weight oil in the winter and lighter weight in the summer because the way the oil properties expanded or contracted is, is that a myth these days or is the oil uh, weight fine that you're doing spec for year round? Um, yeah, it's, it's fine year round. Typically what you'll see, um, you know, I recommend folks look at what their, um, their owner's manual or operator manual for their particular engine has in there. So if you have a, you know, a truck or RV or something of that nature, that's maybe a little heavier duty usage than, uh, just a Honda Civic or something like that, then, uh, you know, there might be an alternative recommendation where, you know, it might be a 520 oil for normal use, but if it's under heavy towing or heavy usage or taxi or police usage, they'll recommend maybe a 530 in place of a 520. Um, so basically the hotter your environment you're in, the thicker you want your oil to be to help with protect your engine with the heat. Okay. So. Um, and I was also looking through uh, some of your questions as well. Mm -hmm. um, it, you discussed how the people back in the day would pour oil out in a can, look at it and go, oh, well, that oil is black. It's bad, right? I mean, that was how we all looked at stuff. Or, you know, And I've, mm -hmm. I saw this the other day on Facebook, too. We're still doing this. But what I was reading, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like the oil is fine. The additive packages are what wears out over time. Yeah. Yep. So your base oil, actually, when it comes out of the ground, we see it as actually clear. So the coloration that you see in the bottle when you first pour it out, uh, when it's brand new, is the additive package that has been put in with it. So some look darker than others, depending on the particular additives that the company has chosen to use and blend in there. Um, then, you know, as you use oil, you, um, you know, there's two issues. There's the oxidation of the oil, um, which over time, as it as it deteriorates, um, you get oxygen molecules in. Those oxygen molecules can conglomerate together, or attract other bad actors, and uh, you know start to cause problems in your engine. Back in the diesel days, um, <clears throat> of back when we had higher sulfur fuel, everybody talked about TAN and TBN. So TAN was total acid number, TBN total base number. Um, so they used to look at on the diesel side, you know, when TAN and TBN crossed was when they figured that the oil was used up. You'd used your alkalinity in the oil. Uh, to neutralize the acids and and you've gone away. Now that we've gone to lower sulfur, sulfur diesel fuel, um, that's not so much the case. We make a lot weaker acids in diesel engines than we did previously. Um, so oxidation is really the number that you want to look at now instead of TAN, TBN. So you get a similar thing in, in gasoline engines. You'll build some acids and things there. It's not as predominant as it is in diesel fuel, but uh, you, know, you want to look at that oxidation number. Um, is really the the big key to uh, uh, your oil performance and oil life these days. Now, Hollywood tells me that oil is black when it comes out of the ground. Are you saying that Hollywood's lying? <laughs> Jed, Jed Clampett uh, might not be accurately representing what crude oil looks like. Black gold. <laughs> yep. <laughs> There's also, I had a question come up. So if additives are the concern about wearing out over time, is there concern about oil shelf life? Like if you were to buy Costco and I went and bought 10 jugs for the rest of my life for my truck and I put it on the shelf. Are there concerns there with the oil going bad? Um, the biggest concern we have over time with, uh, with engine oils is your anti-foam additive uh, that can sometimes fall out of suspension if it's set for a long period of time. So um, it can be kind of revived if the, the oil is vigorously shaken um, to revive that. But that's probably the biggest uh the biggest concern for long term, and uh, I don't recall off the top of my head. I know we have some guidelines for uh, shelf life and things like that for our various products. So, okay, well, let's get into your new product because this is mm -hmm. uh, this is interesting stuff. I pulled up this uh, nice YouTube video. The moment it leaves the factory, critical parts of your engine are building up deposits, and at Valvoline, preventing these damaging deposits isn't enough. We've revolutionized a way to reverse them. Introducing Valvoline Restore and Protect. The first and only motor oil that returns pistons to factory clean by removing up to 100% of deposits with continuous use. Restore your engine to perform like new. With Restore and Protect, another first 
from Valvoline. Okay, so I've talked a lot on this channel about carbon buildup. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a hot topic. I go to OEMs, ask them. They tell me one thing. I go to my viewers. My viewers tell me something else. And then you guys have – I've seen this over the last couple of years. You've, you had a product before that was doing some stuff with this uh, carbon buildup. And now mm -hmm. you have this new product, Restore and Protect. And looking at the details, it, it's not a miracle oil. It seems like you have to do multiple oil changes to get the mm -hmm. carbon buildup off of it. But – Walk me through this a little bit, because I'm, I'm interested in the idea that you have this engine that has carbon buildup on it. That's after you know, top of the 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 uh, on top of the the uh, uh, what am I going to think of the injectors and things. Mm -hmm. um, and people have told me on this channel that it's a mechanical issue that you have to have port injection and direct injection to go ahead and zap all that buildup. That's got to happen. But you're saying, hey, this our oil can make the same ultimate goal of of making that reduction in carbon buildup. Yeah, so there, there's kind of two separate issues there. So, um, so you've got the carbon packing that gets around the ring and the combustion chamber, and that's primarily what the Restore and Protect product is focused on: is cleaning up any carbon deposits that get up around the ring lands. Um, which eventually, if you if you get those carbon deposits there, it can uh, prevent the rings from. Uh, spinning and functioning properly, which can then affect your compression, uh, cylinder wear, you know, you push the chromium rings into the, into the steel cylinder walls, you get wear and stuff there. So, so that product is really focused on cleaning up, um, that carbon that's in the combustion chamber around the ring lands down in the crankcase and stuff. Now, the other topic you're kind of referring to, um, when you get into direct injection engines now versus the previous, uh, multi-point fuel injection engine. So with direct injection, you're you're injecting that fuel right into the cylinder itself, as opposed to being up in the intake runner, like you're talking about before. So previously, um, any deposits that may have um, formed on the back of your intake valve as a result of your crankcase ventilation system, your PVC system, um, the gas would help wash that off the back of the intake valve. Um, so in a direct injection engine, you don't have that. So you can have uh, have that carbon build up on the backside of the valve to the point where you don't even see the, the shape of the valve. It just becomes like a, a giant cone. Um, <clears throat> so the Restore and Protect, I think, will, will help that some because you're still getting some of that product back through the PVC system and back through the valves. Um, but we primarily, I think, have focused that product on cleaning the combustion chambers and things like that. There's certain OEMs that are very, very prone to carbon buildup on the back of the valves. And Valvoline, in our professional product series, we actually have some specific uh, cleaners and treatments and things that go in and, and dissolve and solubilize that intake valve deposit um, for the really, really bad cases. Now, again, Restore and Protect, I think, is going to still going to help that situation through the PVC system, but probably not as much as the direct contact you get with the splash system inside the crankcase where you're cleaning the <clears throat> the rings and things like that. And I think that's an interesting point you bring up with um, the OAM side of this. So I was just talking to an engineer with the new Ram Hurricane engine, and they were talking about how they had gone to companies like yourself or whoever it was, because they don't name names, mm -hmm. but they had worked with them collaboratively and they had worked with them in labs. And so my question for you is how much, how much involvement do you guys have with the OEMs? Are you guys like working with them directly? Or are you trying to develop, it sounds like you're trying to develop oils for them. Yeah. So we work, um, in the in the heavy duty space specifically, we uh, are partners with Cummins. So Cummins is the world's largest uh, engine manufacturer, and we have a thirty year development relationship with Cummins. So we develop our products directly with Cummins for their new engines. We develop specialty products to help them with other things that they have going on in their product line. Uh, so on the heavy duty side, we're very involved with, with Cummins as an OEM. Um, <clears throat> on the passenger car side, we have relationships with all the major OEMs, um, but we probably don't work as closely with, uh, with some of those as we do on, with Cummins on the heavy duty side. So in, in your labs, do you actually have engines that you run and you, you test the oil? I mean, how does it look for the consumer? Yeah, so uh, Valvoline is, uh, as far as I know, is the only oil manufacturer, oil marketer now that still has their own engine lab. Most folks contract out to, uh, there's places like Southwest Research Labs that they go and do dyno testing, things like that. We have our own engine lab in Ashland, Kentucky. Our headquarters are Lexington, Kentucky. 
Um, over in Ashland, Kentucky, we have an engine lab there where we have uh, dynos for uh, basically all fuel types, gas, diesel, natural gas. Um, we also have the ability to test gear oils, coolants. Um, we've got a cold chamber there that we can go down and test uh, uh, super cold or super warm environment stuff. So, so we, and we're actually able to self-certify for API. So I mentioned the API earlier. Um, so there's a series of certification tests that you have to run to become API certified. We're actually able to self-certify our own products as well as we do some outside work for other smaller companies too, for certifying their products. So yeah, we have our own lab, our own technicians, um, and we've got our, our formulators and lab folks here at headquarters in Lexington that, you know, as they're testing new things, they take it over, test it in engines, uh, you know, see how it performs. That's kind of where the whole restore and protect product came from was, uh, you know, some, some experimentation work and things that, that, that our formulators and scientists were working with our engine lab to develop and prove and bring to market. So, yeah, so we're very, very involved that way. So not only uh, is the manufacturer saying this is the engine weight need in the oil and this how long it's going to last, but you guys mm -hmm. are actually working together with them to back up that statement. Yeah, so some of the manufacturers have their own spec above and beyond what API spec would be. Um, so we have to work with them to make sure that we meet whatever specifications they have um, listed in their owner's manuals or, or specs for things. And that's not just a passenger car. You get into heavy duty, you get into construction. Um, you know, all those different manufacturers have either specs that you can apply to and get approval for, or in some cases they might just publish their spec and you say, you know, they just say you need to meet their specifications. So you kind of self-claim whether you meet or don't meet what their recommendations are. So yeah, we've, we spend a lot of time working with OEMs to make sure our products <clears throat> meet their specs and uh, we don't have any issues for our consumers. Hmm. Uh, that's really interesting stuff. Thanks for joining me today. Mm, yeah, no problem. All right. Hey, that's what you got for today at Noel. Well, make sure you check us out at the videos up over there somewhere over that way i'm gonna move around <laughs> uh, check out the website pickuptrucktalk.com also the forum where i got these questions from forum.pickuptrucktalk.com thanks again jason for being here as always mm -hmm. thanks for watching we will see you down the road